What is going on, YouTube? What is going on, Kansas City? And what is going on, everybody? And welcome to the Beat of KC. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I have a tremendous guest. He writes for KC Kingdom. His name is Jacob Milham. What is going on, my friend? I appreciate you. First of all, I truly, truly do appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, you know, you and I have met through KC Kingdom, and, you know, we, we've been trying to get this worked out for a little bit. I've been super busy. <laughs> But I'm glad we can make it happen. What is going on? Man, I'm I'm just riding high right now. You know, I'm I mainly cover the Royals, you know, on a five game winning streak right now. Watch them beat the the White Sox right now. You know, I'm I'm a happy guy on a Monday evening. I know, I know. You know, uh we we both kind of attacked that immediately. You know, I, I've always been a diehard Royals fan um growing up and, and there for a long time. It was it was tough to attend a Royals game or even watch a Royals game. <laughs> So even yeah. just now watching us, you know, it's kind of been okay. Uh, but that kind of leads me to my first question. But before we dive into that, where can everybody find you besides Casey Kingdom so they can give you a follow and, and give you some support? The best place to find me is going to be on Twitter. It's at Mill, the ham. Um, I'm always tagged in my posts on Casey Kingdom as well. So you can just follow them as well at Casey Kingdom FS. All right. Most definitely. And you guys definitely need to get over there and read his articles. They are incredible. And uh, he definitely hit on this Mariners, Whit Merrifield, uh, hot, hot stove take that is going on. So definitely head on over to Casey Keenum and check out Jacob's work for sure. So that, that does truly lead me to the first question. How long have you been a Royals fan? You know, what, how, how deep does that root run for you? And uh, just talk a little bit about that. So I, man, I remember, you know, watching the Royals back when it was everyone hyping up, you know, Hosmer and Moustakis coming up the farm rankings. I mean, it was, there were, there were some pretty, pretty bad years. Um, but I'm, I'm a local guy. I'm from near a small town near Manhattan. Um, you know, it's, they're, they're just my local team, you know, wins, losses. I follow them all throughout. Um, it really brought me back though when, so I left, joined the Navy. And when I was starting to get my feet underneath me after joining the Navy, that's when we were hitting that world series run. Um, and so it was really, I actually went through boot camp with the guy I went to high school with. Um, it was a really cool bonding experience to show people, you know, where we come from and actually be proud of the Royals for once in our life. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, I was actually going through, uh, my training, uh, in the military the year. So it would have been 13 the year before we made the run the first time. Um, and yeah, I just remember like that was always a topic at, at night is when you had kind of had some downtime, you would talk about, you know, where you're from, what's up. And we always talk sports and it happened to be, we, you know, we were starting to get the turnaround for the Royals and, you know, it was pretty awesome. So I can definitely, definitely relate to that. So I do want to talk to you about, you know, what is going on within Major League Baseball. We're truly seeing um, some special things and some truly some special players. I mean, Fernando Tatis, Ronald Acuna, Mike Trout. I mean, there are a ton of good players, but we are getting to the point where some of those players, not specifically those, but some of the players are going to be on the move for com competitive teams uh, in our hometown, our, our Kansas City Royals. Whit Merrifield has been rumored to be on the move, and you wrote a report about that, obviously, for Casey Kingdom. Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm excited to kind of hear your actual, like, face-to-face -face conversation about this because, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge Whit fan. It hurts me to think about it, but I 100% understand. So I'm excited to hear, hear from you. Yeah, it's, um, you know, for, for players that are the heart and soul of Kansas City, it goes – Salvador and Witt. I mean, they are they are right there. They are leaders on this team. They're a veteran presence. But when you look at the timeline of this team, you're just so Whit Merrifield, he he is controlled through this year. He's controlled through 2022, and he has a club option for 2023. All very cheap numbers, even when he, he's kind of had a decline since he signed that extension um but still very cheap a very quality player he currently leads the league in stolen bases 
Um, and like that alone is, is a great stat to be having. And he is a huge defensive presence. Um, I, I don't want to see him go, frankly. I, I really don't want to see him go. It would, it would take a lot. Um, but that's, so our own fan side is Robert Murray and um, network insider John Heyman are saying that Dayton Moore said it would take a quote hefty um, package to get Merrifield out of Kansas City. Um, that is something that fans do need to keep in mind. So it's not a, hey, we're just going to move Merrifield because he's there. He can go. Um, we're we're going to get our we're going to get our payment. Um, this Mariners fit. It's it's probably the best one that I want to, that I would like to see happen. Um, Dylan Moore there on second base for them. Really highly touted prospect coming out of their farm system. Um, just really has not panned out this year. Um, and the Mariners. I mean, you want to talk about how, like the Royals organization's issues. The Mariners haven't won a playoff series since two thousand one. Yeah. Um, they have been. Oof, <laughs> they, they just haven't been around and they're, yeah. they're, close. they're close. They're not having a dominant year, but they are close. And Merrifield, they might go all in on Merrifield. Merrifield could push them over the top. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I, um, when I saw, I read your article, obviously, because, you know, we both work there and I, I think it's good to, to see what people are saying. I honestly agreed with, as soon as I read the, the Mariners aspect, I was hooked for that one. Um, <laughs> I like, I like what they have in their minor league system. And I think you honestly, my only concern is we've seen Dade Moore make moves like this before and not get the best, in my opinion, the best of what we can. I don't know if you can necessarily go wrong with some of the stuff that we're seeing with the Mariners. Um, I did see, and I think it was a little bit extreme. Um, there was some stuff floating around Twitter for if he were to go to the Yankees, there was potential yeah. that they would give and Andrew Har and also Clint Frazier. I would be okay with that because I do think we lack at the third base um, because, granted, Dozier's starting to come around, but I still think we lack there. And, obviously, Clint Frazier, I feel, just needs to play. I mean, you need consistency. You need to play. Um, and so I would be okay with that, I think. But I really do like the youth of what the Seattle Mariners have, and that's what I was excited most about for sure. Now, that does lead me to – uh, kind of a next piece. Do you think anyone else from the Royals, um, you know, that may have a significant role, whether it is a Scott Barlow or a Carlos Santana who has a second year, do you think any of those guys are going to be on the move as well? Because we really haven't heard as much compared to what we've heard about Witt. Yeah, so um, we, we've been hearing a lot more about Witt because he, he truly is a top-tier trade target yeah. this season. Um you know, they um, Adam Frazier from the Pirates just went on the move to the Padres. Um, he was he was my top second baseman in trade mm -hmm. targets, and w Witt is number two. Um, you know, Frazier's he's an all star as well. He currently leads the league in hits. You know, he, he deserves that number one slot. Uh, but I really only have so I have two more that I could see moving pretty easily. And I kind of have another out there one. Um, I'll start with that out there one. I can see Jake Brent. Um, okay. Okay. Made it away pretty easily. Um, right now he's throwing nearly 11 strikeouts per nine innings. I um, was really good metric for those relievers and he's on a one year deal right now. Um, I could just see him going for, you know, one or two prospects and some cash considerations. He's not going to be the needle mover that a lot of these, um, teams are going to be trying to pay their top prospects with, but still still something i would rather see a guy traded than lose him for nothing for sure and you know that kind of i'm glad you hit on that because this is where i have kind of an interesting take because you're seeing the west coast teams targeting a injured danny duffy and they're like hey almost to, almost to the point where we don't care that he's injured and to the extent we don't care if we have to get him back in september is what i'm hearing why not go after a Jake Brents where you know there's a good chance you're probably not going to have to give up as much as you would for a Danny Duffy. Jake Brents has thrown flames from the left side, so you know you can put him out there. You've seen him do pretty well in situations. I'm just curious to, to what your thoughts may be, why they – what would you just personally feel – why they value Danny Duffy a little bit more? Is it the contract or, um, you know, I guess not necessarily the contract, but what 
What do you think they see in Duffy more than they see in Brents? So I, so right now the giants, the Padres and the Dodgers are all looking at this guy right now. Um, and it, it is disturbing that you might not see Duffy on the mound until September. Yeah. Uh, that's what the world's beat writer uh, and Rogers is saying right mm-hmm. now. Um, you know, he, he just has that versatility. He can be a long reliever. He can be a starter if you need him to be. Um, I don't see Brent's, you know, going for more than like two innings at a time. We haven't really seen that a whole lot while he's been in Kansas City. Um, just Duffy was having such a great year to start yeah. off. And then, then the two IL trips just really derailed it. Um, it's, it's tough, but I would really like to, from a Royals perspective, I would really like to see a good bidding war between those three. Um, I really think that's the best way that the Royals can make out with trading Duffy. He's on his last year of his deal. They, they aren't re-signing him. I, you, you just have to admit it, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, and I think if this does end up being kind of a lingering issue for him, I would be fascinated to see if they could sign him to a deal again. Um, and then because I think when you hear issues like this with the flexor muscle, often that tends to lead to Tommy John. Um, and I'd be interested with the lo- the Royals showing so much loyalty to so many different players. Um, I would be because they did it with Mike Miner. Um, I'd be interested to see if they would do that with Danny Duffy. Obviously, Danny Duffy, bury me a Royal type player. Um, you know, I could see him signing a decent deal with the Royals to stay with them and then rehab and then come back at, you know, I mean, cause he's getting older. He's definitely, I think he's my age. I think he's 32, going to be 33. Um, and, you know, uh, I remember, uh, you know, I still go out and kind of sling it every once in a while for slow pitch softball and it, it hurts. It hurts. So I know, know what he's going through a little bit. So, you know, I would just be interested to see what happens with that scenario. Now um, I- I'm excited to see, some of these young players come up and, but before we talk about them, is there any other, I guess, blockbuster trades you can see happening within the MLB? You know, I keep hearing some rumors about Anthony Rizzo, possibly uh, Chris Bryant. Um, I'm hearing, you know, some of those types of trades. If you really kind of had to take a splash, is there anyone that you kind of think are, is going to go somewhere? I, I'm going out on a limb and say it. I wouldn't bet money, but I think Max Scherzer is going to be on the move from the Nationals. Yeah, uh, Nationals are kind of buried out in the East right now. They're they're not contending. Um, Scherzer is kind of a contract albatross for them right now, and they don't really have a very good farm system right now. They're they're kind of in the middle. They they got to pay the contender. They got to completely blow it up right now. Um, I could definitely see Scherzer on the move. Unfortunately, the news is right now that. He might just go up the road to the Mets, yeah. um, which you don't want to, you know, in, in the article you were talking about, I did say that Merrifield would fit well in Chicago mm-hmm. and writing that kind of made my heart hurt a little bit. Um, <laughs> don't want to see like one of your guys in, in a division rival. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, I think that the Mets could give the nationals what, what they want and what they need right now. Um, it's, it's definitely all about the starting pitching right now. Um, Scherzer, Barry are the, are the two that are really leading the charge. Um, Chris Bryant has been, the rumors have kind of been cooling off a little bit, it seems like. Um, but I think that, I don't know if he would be a trade target for a team or just a part of the package, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. You know, that was actually one that I saw as the Mets were very interested in Chris Bryant's service and bringing him in and, um, you know, plugging him in that lineup. You know, I speaking of Max Scherzer, too, you know, I constantly am thinking how big of a piece he would be to a San Diego Padres who, you know, it would be nice to I, they have obviously the prospects to make that happen, I feel. Um, they didn't, you know, exhaust them all in the Clevenger trade. And so I think it would be interesting to see if he could find his way out there and just really plug that in. But, you know, who knows? I mean, it, there, there's always those teams that sneak in last minute that 
you find out later on they've been talking to him the whole time and you're like well i didn't see this coming and that yep. happens so uh but yeah I'm, I'm excited this always ends up coming down to the wire and it seems like the last couple of hours there's just trades 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 and then you got to go back and look at them and evaluate them so um i'm excited for sure now I do want to transition over to our minor league system because if some of these trades do happen, those holes are going to have to be filled. Um, and, you know, I, I'm excited for Edward Olivares if he ever can find his way to stay up in Kansas City, but yeah. that does kind of tend to go a little bit deeper. You got Bobby Witt on the uprise. You got Nick Prado on the uprise. Do you think those guys are positioned to come up to Kansas City this year, or do you think that – They've worked them to a point where they're okay with where they're at, and then they're going to start their time in service next year. So in in the past with, with other prospects, Dayton Moore has expressed an interest in going level by level, and you have to dominate at that level for one month, and then you move on to the next one. You, you can't have started off that month's timeline better than Nick Prado and Witt have down at AAA. I mean, they're both absolutely on fire. Mm -hmm. um is I mean, it's it's been amazing to, amazing to watch honestly um so I'll, I'll give you two answers here i would expect to see them in kansas city very very late in the season you know okay. maybe like september or so um if more is serious about this team contending in 2022 he has to do that yeah. you can't introduce them at the beginning of next year and just hope it all works out um, it ha we have to start that time right now. Um, secondly, I kind of hope that they'll stay at AAA um, with this AAA showcase going on right now. Um, I'm just down the road from the AAA um, affiliate of the Baltimore Orioles. Um, okay. And I would love to see the, uh, the Omaha Storm Chasers come out east. And I would love to be able to see Nick Prado and Bobby with, with my own two eyes. Um, we also need to keep an eye on the AA level. Um, MJ? Down there, he is who he is putting up historical numbers, not just for the Kansas City Royals, but for minor leagues in general. Absolutely crushing it. Um, that is that is one guy I would not be surprised to see come to Kansas City in September either. Yeah, for sure. And you know, he man, what he did he he's up to 20. I know he hit two. Is he 24, yep. 23, or 24 home runs? Last um, I knew he's 23 home runs. Yeah, and you know, for it's hard for me because when I see him play, I'm like, man, he's not – because we're used to Salvador Perez. We're used to that 6'3", 6'4", that big-bodied frame catcher. And then you see MJ Melendez, and you're like – kind of like, what? And so, I mean, he is – yeah, I, I, I'm i excited for him for sure. Um, I think he is definitely going to be a special talent. And I think once he does get here, I think that's going to help alleviate – some of the stuff that Salvador Perez is going through as a catcher at times where you can give him that DH break and you know that you're putting plugging in consistency uh, there in the catcher spot behind him. And, you know, Cam Gallagher is good for what he does, but he's not, I mean, he's not going to be that guy. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm excited for what we have coming. It's just, I think there's a timeline and, and obviously there's expectations and things like that. So, with that being said, Raul, uh, I always say Raul, yeah, Raul Mondesi Jr., uh, yep. what are your thoughts on his current situation? You know, he obviously uh, can't stay healthy. Um, yep. I, I've questioned whether he understands the difference between being injured and being hurt. Um, do you think he has a future in a Kansas City Royals uniform? Um, I, I think he does. Um, it's – his clock is really, really ticking, though. Um, just, just touching on the on the whole injury thing, and this this might start a whole other tangent between the two of us. But just just for example, in in tonight's game, uh, Nicky Lopez didn't get to start at shortstop um, because the coaching staff told him said that he was injured. Mm -hmm. They quoted Nicky Lopez on the broadcast saying that, "Hey, my dad told me to play through when I was hurt." I was good to go. My coach has told me not to go. Um, and the, the tangent that I can see starting is I don't think this coaching staff has done Mondesi any favors. Um, you could probably say that 
about 80 percent of this farm system right now um it is it is certainly an issue but back back to the original point he i, I don't know he's he's got to figure out something because wit mm-hmm. is right wit is you know putting up much better numbers than mondesi was at this stage of his career at that level um did, didn't he play a little bit of second base when he was healthy mondesi who, who, Mondesi, yeah, because they had um, Alcides Escobar playing shortstop. Right. Um, I I could see that possibly working out, um, but you don't you don't want to bank on that. Yeah. You know, you you have to. So let's let's say Wit is traded. You do have to think about the possibilities in second base right there. Um, you know, I've looked a little bit about you know can Nicky Lopez slide over if Wit starts at shortstop. Um, you know, maybe Mondesi can fill that second base role. I I don't know, but it's not good when you have a former top prospect that you can't count on to be there. Um, I've seen it all the time in the chat rooms, and I hate to repeat it, but I got to. The best ability is availability, mm-hmm. and he doesn't have that. Yep, for sure. You know, and and that's obviously you know, uh, Nicky Lopez was actually in the running for a gold glove at second base. Um, I think he would definitely be completely okay with playing second base. I think he just wants to play. And we're seeing when he's given a consistent, you know, day in and day out routine of going out and playing the game of baseball, having fun playing the game, we're seeing a good result. And I think Nicky's actually working himself into a deal, which leads me to believe that's probably why finally they're, you know, they're kind of like, Oh, we can trade Wit because they're seeing some success from Nikki. They know they have Bobby Witt Jr. coming up at shortstop. They know that, hey, if we have to, we can plug in Mondesi in other spots, hopefully in the future. So I think that's kind of why we're finally seeing that relief of, I think we're accepting to let Wit go out to the pasture, I guess you could say. So, um, yeah. But I'm excited. I'm excited, honestly, for for what we have coming up because you still have a ton of other prospects that we, I mean, you could honestly talk hours and hours and hours about because, I mean, they got Brady McConnell down there and and they got all these different other position players that they've been drafting and, I mean, the pitching staff is, you know, that's that's what was exciting is to finally see yesterday, a a, a good result, of a pitcher who they've put the time, the effort into not only drafting, but kind of building up. He comes up, he doesn't necessarily have the greatest of success, if any, goes back down with kind of a chip on his shoulder, comes back up and shoves for eight innings. You know, what are your thoughts on Daniel Lynch and really this, I guess, this um, pitching staff of the future? So let's let, let's take away Daniel Lynch's stats from yesterday for a second. I okay. want you to think back just one week from yesterday the the freaking royals got blanked by matt harvey and the orioles and i look i i had to write that piece for kc kingdom and i was let's let's burn it down let's just keep salvi and let's keep it moving yeah uh, that was the, the Royals were already on a really good winning streak by that point, but that was like, may, maybe this team has something. Um, Daniel Lynch is still, you know, he's still ranked as the number two prospect. Um, I would certainly hope that his name gets taked off, taken off of prospect list here soon and make him an everyday starter. Um, it, was, it, w- it was just so uplifting to see, you know, like this. He, he didn't throw a ton of strikeouts. He, he threw four strikeouts. But he went eight innings, and I don't know if you were watching the game, but right after he got taken out, all those runs and all those hits started coming in. And I think that showed how good of a pitcher he was on oh, yeah. Sunday, how good of a pitcher he could be in the future. He's, he's still fairly young. He's 24 years old. Um, he's still got a little bit more time with the team. I, you know, just overall – this you know you've got Kowar down AAA who is absolutely a beast right now I know he hasn't shown it in his um, start so far for Kansas City but you know they'll bring him up he'll make a start he won't do very well they'll send him back down to AAA and he'll just dominate 
Um, they just need to show a little bit more patience with them. Um, Asa Lacey is another pitching prospect people need to keep their eye on. Um, unfortunately, he's had a little bit of injury issues yeah. lately. Um, just after, after so many years of the Royals drafting these high pitching prospects, um, you know, the first one comes to mind is Zimmer. I know yeah. he's still on the team. But when we drafted him, like, that was like, hey, this is our na- next Zach Greinke. Like, he's going to be the big, big deal. He, he just wasn't. That's, you know, sometimes it doesn't pan out. Um, but between Lynch, Lacey, Coar, uh, Bubich is another big one. Just those young guys, like this young core. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to see Holland and Santana go off into the sunset. I'm ready for these young guys to start playing and start showing what they could do for this club. For sure. Uh, there's tons of them coming. I mean, there's a slew of pitching. And, you know, Dayton's been quoted to say that pitching is the currency of baseball. And I would 100% have to agree because if your pitching staff is solid, um, you know, you're, you're going to do very well when, when your hitting may not be doing the best. If you have some solid pitching, uh, you know, it, it, it pays off for sure. Um, you know, I, I'm, I wrote a piece for Casey Kingdom. It was my first article, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I didn't necessarily label Brady Singer a bust, and I'm sure you saw it uh, yeah. because at the very Good end art. I said, yeah, at the very end I said, you know, I'm not calling him a bust, but I, I've gone through this n- enough times to, to, to sense and, and feel what we're going through as, as a fan – and really just a person looking from the outside in. We've seen it with Luke Hochaver. The hype was around Luke Hochaver. He was a first-round, first-overall pick, I do believe. Um, We've seen it with numerous other ones. Brady Singer had a ton of hype around him because he fell to us at a certain point in the draft, and we took him. Um, But it's a guy that I feel is not willing to make those adjustments right now. He's he says he feels comfortable in certain situations, but when you're throwing only two pitches at a starter, you're living over the heart of a plate, you're going to get slacked around. And I mean, you know, like you said, when we get shoved against by Matt Harvey, that kind of opened your eyes. For me, when you're getting tattooed by the Baltimore Orioles, that opened my eyes, especially against, uh, uh, you know, this up and coming young stud. So I'm not by no means calling Brady Singer a bust but I definitely think he needs to go and figure it out. Would you be against sending Brady Singer back to the minors? I I would like to see him. I'd like to see him go back down to AAA for sure. Um, he's on the IL right now. Um, I'm not I'm not sure what landed him there, but he just he needs to go figure it out because you're right. He has kind of you know in his interviews and in just his body language, he seems a little unwilling to learn. Um, Maybe there's just a little bit of an attitude uh, change that needs to happen. Um, you know, he, he's been roughed up. And if, you know, being roughed up as bad as he has been doesn't change that attitude, I, I don't know what will. Um, he, is, he is dangling on that cliff of being labeled a bust already. Um, I, I hate to say it. What, he was drafted in 2018? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it, it's awful close. He's... You know, his, his clock's ticking. He's got some time to figure it out. For sure, for sure. And I was kind of waiting to see how you would answer that because um, I've seen a lot of people have some major issues with Cal Eldridge, Eldridge excuse me, rightfully so. Um, you know, I, I paid very, very close attention yesterday when they did a mound visit, and it's almost as if Salvi has taken on the role of pitching coach and there really isn't any attentiveness to – Cal anymore it's almost like they've just ignored him as the pitching coach and he's just a body that comes out um what are your thoughts on Cal and obviously uh, every person I've talked to about the Royals is against him uh are you kind of in that same boat and are going to be wishing him well wishes as the season ends so I will I will back up what you said I did notice that um tonight you know minor he had you know he gave up a couple he gave up a walk he gave up a uh, an extra base hit um, and they came out and it was a little strange. Like Eldridge was positioned o- physically away from everyone else. Um, you know, you, you can't be an effective coach if 
the players on the field won't listen to you. Um, yeah, he's I, – I wish him the best of luck, um, but he's he's got to go. It's it, it's bad. Um, you know, when, when we're going through looking at these people that can be traded and you have to think like, well, you know, we can't go get a raw – pitching prospect because they're not going to be developed properly like what does that say about your your pitching uh coaching staff mm-hmm. it, it it just doesn't inspire confidence um and i don't think you can get much worse by moving on from him if that makes sense yeah uh, i'm sure there are a lot of good minds out there that would you know bring that jolt of energy the royals need to their pitching staff for sure For sure. You know, and that's kind of something I always I've said and, you know, just kind of understanding how baseball works. You're not really going to gain anything this point in the season being where you're at um, by firing Cal Eldridge and then bringing in somebody new. If you can even find that, that's the issue. So you kind of are stuck, you, you know, you might as well ride it out, finish it out and then, you know, send him away and then really evaluate what you got for the next one. Um I think Mike Matheny should, you know, pick the next one personally because of his previous experience as a catcher um, and understanding what it takes to really kind of work a pitching staff. I mean, he had some pretty solid starters when he was the catcher. And then obviously Yadier Molina comes on behind him and, and, and is doing the same thing as he's the head coach. So I think he kind of understands. Um, he went out and actually got Maddox for when he was there in St. Louis for a little bit. Um, And so I honestly would like to see Matheny do that. Maybe it'll help solidify. I think Matheny's issue is he's been really kind of had a problem establishing a bullpen. We knew that was something he was bringing from St. Louis as well. You know, what are your thoughts on the, on the issue of the bullpen? And do you think that that's played into any factors on how some of the results of games for the Royals have turned out? Um, You know, that, that bullpen, for the Royals for years. That was, that was the constant, like that was, oh, yeah. that was what the team could rest on. Um, and, you know, just, just yesterday, you know, seeing Santana come out after Lynch and just absolutely get blasted right off the get. Um, it just wasn't there. There has to be a little bit more of a active attention to this bullpen there's a lot of really good pitchers in that bullpen you got barlow you got brents right now um Zim- zimber's doing so- solid out of the bullpen i'm i'm not doubting him there um holland holland's been a little iffy um he certainly isn't his 2015 holland but mm-hmm. uh he's he's still around somehow some way <laughs> um, it's we, we, we just need to move on. Yeah. I feel like there's there's a little bit of that nostalgia, a little bit of that, oh, this player was good. Maybe they yeah. still got um, – I definitely feel that way with Irvin Santana. Um, that, in, in my opinion, he should have been uh, designated um, this morning. I, For sure. I wouldn't I wouldn't want him on my team after that. That was pretty bad. <laughs> well, and you know, I, I saw a stat – that said he hasn't pitched since like July 10th, maybe it was. And it was, it kind of caught me off guard. Like what? And I know for a fact, there's been some scenarios where we've needed at least three innings eaten up in a stretch of games, because I would have to say there are times where this bullpen has been taxed. Our, Our starting pitching there for a long time seemed like they weren't making it past four innings for a very long time. So don't get me wrong. I understand the bullpen has been taxed, but I still think you should have those roles established to understand like Irvin Santana is going to be our long guy. We may have said whoever else as another long guy, but I think roles need to be established. Like I would expect Stalmont to be your closer. And there's been times where Stalmont has been available, but they go to like a Greg Holland or a Wade Davis or, um, they, they've even thrown Scott Barlow in there, which I'm completely okay with, but that's not the role that he's probably been in, informed of. So that's just kind of been my, a little bit of my beef, a little bit of my soapbox there, because I think there has been some scenarios where 
if the bullpen was executed the way a Ned Yost would have executed a bullpen, we might be in a different situation with an outcome of a baseball game. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think we do have some special, special players within the bullpen. Um, and I think that they just, they need to have their role established. Like Kyle Zimmer has been doing okay. You know, uh, unfortunately he was a first round pick and you don't always want that to be, but he's done a, he's done what he needs to do. I think at, at least for the last couple of years. So, but man, I tell you, I'm, I'm excited for all of baseball. What yep. this is kind of where it gets fun. I, I like to start asking some fun questions. Um, all right. So with the postseason coming up, what is like your go-to like postseason meal? Like, you know, you got, it, it starts to cool off. The temperature starts to kind of, you know, you got the, in my case, it's the hoodies and the shorts. Um, every once in a while I'll rock a beanie, but uh, you know, you're getting to that season. I, I like to bust out the potato soup. What's up? What's your go-to like playoff early football time food, like meal? So it's got a, I, I got it down to a T. I got an Aldi just down the road. Oh they yeah, got, hey, take a big pizza. That's that's one of my favorite things on a on a good old game day. Um, you know, it's it's six bucks down at Aldi. I don't mean this to be an advertisement for them, but uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> or, um, yeah, you know, I'll I'll just go I'll go pop one in uh, when uh, when warm ups start. You know, it's just just sit down with a with a couple of beers and and my wife there. I'm. I'm pretty, I'm pretty chill when it comes to game day stuff, oh, especially, yeah. I mean, but some of those I miss going to Kansas city and just, I would find a random tailgate. I ain't gonna lie. I never went with the intention of tailgating, but if you take a, you know, a 12 pack with you, you're going to find some friends real fast. Oh yeah. So, Most definitely. I, Most definitely. So uh, with the, because you're so close to Manhattan, I would assume that you're kind of connected to what's going on with K-State and everything yeah. that's going on with the Big 12. What are your thoughts uh, on this whole Big 12 thing? And, uh, you know, does K-State end up in the Pac-12? Do they end up staying in a Big 8 and, you know, pulling some teams in to make it back to the Big 12? What are your thoughts on that? So I'll, I'll preface my my thoughts by this. Um, so I'm, I'm writing an article right now for KC Kingdom um, from the Missouri football aspect, you know, should they have stayed in the Big 12 back when they left? Um, I will say this about about K-State. I think there's there's a lot of things lining up in the stars. I don't know if the Big 12 is going to be around for too much longer. Um, that's it, It's frustrating. But when you have multiple original Big 8 teams leaving – um, that's, that's not good. You know, the, the big 12 was initially the big eight and then the four Texas schools coming together and making that when you have, I mean, you have Texas leaving, you have Oklahoma leaving and th those are both for sure. Those aren't speculation anymore. Mm -hmm. They're, they're gone. Yep. Um, Nebraska, Missouri, Colorado, A&M all gone. I think, I, I think you just need to find a decent geographical, location um but but it all comes down to the money you know they just built that you know they keep on building new facilities there in manhattan yeah yeah um i could definitely see k-state going to the pac-12 i don't want to i don't want to see it but it would make sense and that gives the pac-12 a good recruiting line into the midwest mm -hmm. um, I, they're trying to get that with colorado just, you know, didn't make it past the Rockies there too much. But, you know, if you get K-State, there's rumors that K-State and KU are a package deal. Yeah. Uh, and I, I could certainly see that being advantageous. You know, I missed seeing uh, seeing the border war between Missouri and Kansas mm -hmm. in every sporting event. Um, but I, both of them going to the Pac-12, you got some good football competition, you got some good baseball competition and some good basketball competition. Um, but they're, they're going to have to, if they want to get back to the Big 12, they're going to have to figure out something fast. Um, yeah. Cincinnati, Memphis, Houston, those are all on the table um, from what I've been seeing on the chatter. I, I, I don't see those being the needle movers. So you're going you're gonna to tell me you're going to replace Oklahoma 
and Texas with Cincinnati and Memphis, I mean, between the money, the competition, it just doesn't stack up in my mind. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I, I see, I kind of see 2024, this Big 12 might fall off the cliff. For sure. You know, I think my biggest concern with going to the Pac-12, even if, you know, I, I root for KU, but I definitely am a Big 12 fan. I always have been because of what it's provided Kansas City. Um, because of the Big 12 tournament and the fan base that comes in for the Big 12 tournament and the rivalries that we've created throughout the years within the Big 12. My only biggest thing is if K-State goes to the Pac-12, if KU goes to the Pac-12, we now have to adjust to those time frames of when those games are going to be played. And I think that's rough um, because of us in the Midwest having to stay up till 10 o'clock to watch a game that starts on that time zone, I think that's a little bit frustrating. So part of me hopes um, that that doesn't happen, but I think the more and more I'm hearing, there's a chance KU might slot right into the Big Ten, and then uh, unfortunately K-State might. But, you know, that's what's kind of cool about this whole scenario is it's just all unknown. I mean, we the two, the, or the two known factors are that Texas and Oklahoma are gone. Outside of that, it's just everyone's trying to pluck and hear the news and what's going on, and I think that's what's kind of exciting. This is almost like the trade deadline for the MLB. I mean, you really have no idea, and it's just an exciting time. Um, yep. So that does lead me to, uh, you know, you have been – I've noticed you've been writing for Missouri. Um, are you kind of – do you have any ties to Missouri? Is there something that you enjoy writing for can or for Missouri football for, or is it just uh, – Kind of, you're just a football fan. It's it, it's a little bit of both. Um, my dad's originally from northern uh, Missouri, up in okay. Hannibal, Missouri. Yes. Uh, you know he's got he's got property right down right now down in the Ozarks. Um, you know it, he wants to retire there. Yeah, um, he is. So our my family does have some ties there, um, and I I do genuinely enjoy riding for Missouri football. Um, yeah. It's it's a good school. It's got a good culture about it. Um, you know, I know there was a little bit of a little bit of diciness back a couple of years back, um, but I definitely think that under Drinkwitz, it's going to be you know wa watch out for that team. Yeah, most definitely. You know, I even as a KU fan, as I've gotten older, I've kind of uh, appreciated um, Missouri for a little bit and. Um, you know, our house is divided. As you can see, even behind me, I got a KU blanket, but my wife is a diehard Mizzou fan. So um, I kind of have to come to appreciate what Mizzou has. And most KU fans might blast me for that. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's it's not, you know, when you really kind of enjoy football as a whole um, and you just enjoy watching it, uh, I think it it really, if you slapped any game up, I'd be okay with watching it. But that does lead me to the next thing. Do you play fantasy football at all? Um, I play, yes, and I lose, yes. So uh, <laughs> that, that's how that goes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty damn bad. I ain't going to lie. Yeah, as, but that's as long as it's fun, you know. And that's, oh. that's why I always like to ask the question because I think everyone has a different approach. Um, I think there's – you know, I, I play it because I'm addicted to football and when it happens and everything that's about it. But a lot of people play it because it creates awareness and it's an enjoyment to, to create a reason to watch football. Um, so, I, you know, I you say you're bad at it, but, you know, it makes it fun. It, it makes you enjoy yep. football even more. It does. So. It does. I'll, you know, for some reason, I'll be slapping up the Bills and Dolphins game for – no other reason than to watch what Stephon Diggs does. Um, it does. Fantasy football has definitely been a great thing for the NFL. Um, it gives, you know, just just a whole bunch of stat heads. It gives them reason to tune into every game. Um, it's definitely opened up another door for that market. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely enjoy it. But, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty bad. Awesome. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's awesome because, you, like I said, you know, I think – I think fantasy football provides a, a great, you know, way to enjoy the game. And, you know, even beforehand, I enjoyed football. But like you said, it's almost like it could be the two worst teams that are playing in the NFL on Sunday night football. But you're going to tune in and get hyped up because you might need five points from said player to win your, your week. So I really think they – 
they've created a way to market such a tremendous thing and it's incredible because i'm i'm hooked on it for sure so <laughs> i do it every year yeah you, you dive in every year you got i yep. always like him in messaging because my actual fantasy football is year round um oh. and and we have contracts, we have salaries, we have all kinds of things that go into it. And then, you know, I do the typical like snake style drafts and I, I got to have it all. I got to get everything. And, and yeah, so it's so much fun. So I definitely had to ask, man, but Jacob, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I definitely want to do this again. Um, you know, as the se season continues to progress, I really would like to talk to you again, probably after the trade deadline. And if we see what happens for sure. Uh, with Whit Merrifield and and maybe anybody else and uh, what happens within the major leagues, but Watch I really do appreciate. Do what? Watch out for Soler. Yeah, he's for, yeah. Uh, we need to keep him plugging away because <laughs> he needs gone. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So, but man, I do. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, what you're doing. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll be real with you. You kind of inspired me and motivated me to write on Casey Kingdom because, you know, you're plugging away and I'm like, I got to keep up with Jacob. So uh, I really do appreciate everything you're doing, man. And, and I thank you for coming on. Of course, man, my pleasure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always here for you. I'm always to, here to give you my bad takes. Um, <laughs> you just want to clarify, I'm not advocating for anyone going to the White Sox or the Yankees. Um, <laughs> I'm the worst for both teams. <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome hey real quick before we wrap this up where can everybody find you one more time go on twitter find me at jmill the ham there it is and casey kingdom he writes amazing amazing articles for all you mizzou fans out there head on over there so jacob i appreciate it and uh, you guys know how i wrap this up as always i appreciate you checking out the beat of kc and have a good day <laughs>